there's a lot of specific design challenges on any film, and, and especially this one. This, this, is a, this is an unusual brief. When I started the film, I wanted to implement as much real-world stuff as I could to have the movie have this kind of this grounded feel. The main challenge actually for this movie is making it just as gritty and true to life as stuff that was shot by Neil. You have your aliens, and obviously the question is going to be, from somebody, do the aliens have sex? How do they reproduce? It's always a nervous moment seeing your sets on camera for the first time. There's two levels that the science fiction gets merged with reality. I mean, visually and then conceptually. Neil had this film rattling around his head for a few years, and um, he's very, very interested in the design process. So when I first came on board, he had a whole heap of reference stuff that he went, here you go, let check this out. The process is, starts with drawings, the basic drawings done by Greg Broadmoor, and then they went into um, 3D design, which David Ming was doing, and there's that sort of sculpting. And there's, as Neil saw these these things in 3D, then he was able to say, yes, more of that, less of that, more of that. Most of the design in the film was done by Weta Workshop in New Zealand. And then as we got into, you know, closer to actual production, Phil Ivey and the art department team that actually built the sets and some of the props were involved in design as well. But there's an artist at Weta, Greg Broadmoor, who did a lot of the, uh, the alien technology. Yeah, pre-production, I mean, that's part of the problem, of course, that, that me and, uh, and Larry and Dave and, uh, and all the design team are most involved with. Um, just visualizing everything in the film, trying to get a feel for what we're actually going to be looking at. I mean, that, and that goes down from the smallest thing, like the little fuel cells that we that we made, through to the saucer and the interiors and, the, you know, the, all the shape language that goes into everything, the alien culture, what they're dressed in, you know, what their biology is. He was responsible for a lot of the alien technology, and we, we spent a long time, I mean, the whole, the, you know, the whole of 2007 when we were developing the idea. We did literally thousands of illustrations. And so the weaponry was his department. There are all kinds of weapons equipment designed for, uh, for District 9. Some of it veered from being very obviously like weaponry. You know, it looks like military firearms, but in this, um, uh, that's, a, that's another thing, another aspect of the, um, of the design is that it had to, you know, there's no camouflage. It's, no, it, it's actually quite a high contrast, obvious item. And there's a very machined, uh, almost mass market look to it, which I wanted to get in there. Because, you know, I want the alien technology to feel corporate as well. This is high technology from another world, another galaxy, but uh, existing in the physical space of Earth in a believable way. This is Christmas, my friends. This is the biggest find that I've ever seen. And then the organic stuff, the alien was, you know, it's gone through many iterations as well. There's hundreds of illustrations of the alien. And uh, I very clearly wanted to have this insect aspect to it. Uh, well, throughout the entire um, design process of the creature, um, we were really very intensely art directed by Neil. He worked with us very closely to make sure that the final creature that ended up on screen was very much his own vision. When Neil talked to us about what he was looking for with the aliens, he was, um, very specific in that he wanted them to have the feeling of insects that are different than a lot of the sort of aliens that we've seen in the past. He wanted to keep it very colorful and sort of contrasty bright colors that, that sort of would uh, would stand out as being, you know, something definitely non-reptilian or anything like that, something just you don't see at that size ever really. In the beginning, we had a whole bunch of illustrations, and as we started to refine it, it's, it, it it started to it started to become something that had this insect quality, but was bipedal. And then once we got into the insect idea, it was well, could it have this kind of could it have different colors like a beetle, or a bee, or a wasp? Oh, oh, what is it? Check it on the side. Check it on the side there. That's a... oh, control. Yeah, you can find a member. I need a population uh, control team. At the alien eggs were designed really early on, actually, um, and they were. Again, they had to be a classic. 
um, archetype. They had to be instantly recognisable. Now, the idea behind the egg is that it's um, quite a unique form of reproducing. The, the alien is asexual. They are also excreting waste, which is um, which we do with uh, various things. We've got um, pus, and then a dark alien blood, and then again our, um, our oily um, goo. Uh, they're just clear, um, like KY jelly, just to just to give them that um, that feeling that they are a three-dimensional, translucent, sweating alien thing. They make their egg and they lay it, but then the question was, is well, how if if the eggs somewhere else, you know, how have they adapted to, because in the ship, the eggs would be put in an area and looked after by, by the, the dominant race. So here, they've had to figure out a way to do it. So they use, we decided they use animal carcasses. The look that Neil was going for was, he wanted the sci-fi to be familiar. And the fact that it was in a third world country, in a shanty town, is the unfamiliar thing for the audience. Uh, so we drew inspiration from many films um, over the last 15, 20 years, from Alien, through to Alien Resurrection, which had some absolutely amazing sets. Almost like late 70s and, and, and 80s science fiction. All of the films that come from that era have a very particular design look about them. And we consciously try to put some of that design uh, geometry into the stuff that we were doing. So a lot of the designs, the spaceships, some of the alien environments, the inside of the mothership, a lot of that will have hints of classic science fiction that, that was the 70s and the 80s. We wanted it to be dark, damp, humid. You want it to feel as though the ship is still alive, at rest, but still alive. The feeling that humans have been boring through it for like 20 years, so that all that rubbish that's in there. Uh, first of all, it, would have, it started as alien rubbish, but then it's uh, become human rubbish. And the place is an absolute pigsty. The biggest challenge was something that's as big as the mothership, which is about two, two and a half kilometers in diameter, is to make something that's that scale look realistic. Because it, it has a lot of detail, but you don't see the detail directly because it's so huge. The design inspiration for the mothership was basically uh, large refineries, like oil refineries and gas refineries and stuff like that. And so it had to be hyper detail. I also wanted to make it feel like a refinery, uh, which was something we went through all the design work had to feel like it, uh, it was potentially something that could stop on the ship and start mining resources. So look underneath it, it's just covered in scaffolding and piping and big reservoirs of ore and, and fuel. It's how it interacts with the atmosphere or something that big, you know. You see stuff on the ground and it sort of goes off into the distance and it gets more atmospheric. It's how it sort of fades away, you know, around, sort of as it goes away from where you are. Uh, behind me are the first components of the dropship, which uh, has come from the mothership, has landed underneath CJ Shack, and he's quietly been working on for the last 10, 15 years. Being a ship that had been compacted under the earth for 20, 20 odd years, or 15 years, needed to have a very cramped feel about it. This whole thing's under, under your shack. For 20 years, you've had this fucking thing hidden down here. This is, this is very illegal. I mean, this is, this is a fine, you know. So inside the story, you have this major multinational company, which is called Multinational United, which in my mind is, is sort of a, a conglomeration of, of most of the world's big companies that has won all of the, the, the rights and the patents and, you know, everything that they can that they, that they will be able to glean from the alien technology. But in return, it's not the United Nations, it's our own form of the United Nations, has uh, stated that they're then also responsible for looking after the aliens. It has this other element of private military contractors and, and everything being privatized and the idea of privatized police and privatized zoning. And, you know, it more and more gets taken away from the South African government and more and more gets gets put into the, the hands of this kind of ethicless and moralless huge conglomerate. What we designed there was the heavy armor, which again was playing to the, all the um, MNU clean, white, and um, simple, benign looking. So their armor is quite futuristic. It has some allusions to the alien stuff because I wanted it to be, you know, really m make that connection that MNU had obviously been trying to understand the alien technology. Okay. First Reaction Battalion and those mercenaries are based on a South African company who was very involved in Africa 
in the 90s. Rights groups have demanded that mercenaries should comply with all UIO regulations in District 9. When we came across Shuella, it was um, very much in a state of flux, people being moved out, so a lot of checks had been felt. So we went through a whole process of designing a town that was going to suit our needs in terms of geography for fight action or you know, gen just general eviction stuff. Um, we went through this whole process of buying shacks from people that were living there and moving them, using their materials. I think for the entire scrub, 95% of the, of the props, it's around here. You understand? Because seeing that the film is more about felt, you understand? And you know, all the older things, you understand? 95% of the stuff, it's all around here. The are closing in on the Nigerian compound. All of the special effects in the film aren't, they're not groundbreaking special effects in terms of pushing new technology or new software, but the exosuit itself is a slightly unique concept in the way that it's portrayed. You've got to think of it from every angle of how it's actually going to move, and you know that you're probably, as you're designing these things, you're probably creating more problems than you're um, solving. When Vickers gets into the suit, this is an extension of himself, so suddenly we have to start paying attention to his body language, the way he runs, the way he pauses, the way he tilts his head, you know, and we ended up shooting reference footage of um, Vegas performing. Yeah, I'm immensely proud of my construction team. They I scared the hell out of them with the, the first set of plans I gave them. But they really rose to the occasion. Um, I've had a lot of fun with them and their quality has been fantastic.